The quest for good explanations is, I believe, the basic regulating principle not only of science, but of the Enlightenment generally. It is the feature that distinguishes those approaches to knowledge from all others, and it implies all those other conditions for scientific progress I have discussed. It trivially implies that prediction alone is insufficient. Somewhat less trivially, it leads to the rejection of authority, because if we adopt a theory on authority, that means that we would also have accepted a range of different theories on authority. And hence, it also implies the need for a tradition of criticism. It also implies a methodological rule, a criterion for reality, namely, that we should conclude that a particular thing is real if, and only if, it figures in our best explanation of something. End quote. From David Deutsch, The Beginning of Infinity, Explanations That Transform the World, page 22 to 23. Welcome to TalkCast and to episode 105, where today I will be providing a breakdown of chapter 4, which is Criteria for Reality from The Fabric of Reality by David Deutsch. Now, what you heard at the beginning there was a quote from The Beginning of Infinity, from chapter 1 of that book, which contains not only a summary, basically, for the motivation of the book, placing this quest for good explanations at the foundation of our civilization, of the Enlightenment, but it also contains an important kernel linking David's two books together. It speaks of a criterion for reality, what it means for something to be real. And this explanation given by David, this criterion, is, so far as I know, unique to his philosophy and basically solves a problem at the intersection of ontology and epistemology or metaphysics, whatever you want to call this thing, this study of existence. And I think it is actually an improvement on what Popper said about realism and existence. It's something I've discussed with people over the years now, many times, because it is something people criticise. But we have to be careful with what David is saying here. He says that we should conclude that a thing is real or that a thing exists if, and only if, it figures in our best explanation of something. This is the condition under which we can conclude its existence. If among our best explanations of the world, unicorns appear nowhere, then there is no reason to conclude they are real, that they exist. Now, does this rule out unicorns being found in the future? Of course not. Nothing can. They may exist. We haven't ruled out their possibility of existing. We are merely saying that we cannot conclude they exist now, given our best explanations. Concluding they exist now would be to use something other than reason to come to that conclusion. But in day-to-day -day language, we do not need to preface all claims that a thing exists or that a thing is real with, for example, we can conclude koalas exist because they feature in our best explanations. We simply say koalas exist and the rest goes without saying. So too for things we say do not exist. Unicorns do not exist. And that means the same thing as we know unicorns do not exist, which means unicorns do not feature in our best explanations of reality. Now, it could turn out that we are wrong about the existence of unicorns, but saying something like we don't know if unicorns exist and thinking that that is the same kind of claim as we don't know if alien life exists confuses problem situations. These claims, we don't know if alien life exists and we don't know if unicorns exist, look kind of similar, but actually they're not symmetrical. Our best theories of life seem to predict that it will arise if and where it can, but those same theories do not allow us to predict what particular species will arise, for example, unicorns. In other words, life beyond the solar system is postulated as a reasonable hypothesis by some precisely because there do exist good explanations of why life should be possible beyond the solar system. And this would solve a problem, the problem of Earth being uniquely suited in the universe for life of any kind. Again, this is not symmetric with postulating unicorns exist, because postulating the very special case of unicorns solves no outstanding problem in science. And that's the difference. Does the thing solve a problem or not? I've actually made podcasts before 
about existence in general and realism, go all the way back to episode 55 for an episode titled Existence, where I have a 15-minute discussion about what it means for something to exist. And so I'm going to be going over some of that material today, but in greater depth from the perspective of what the fabric of reality has to say, and towards the end, what even Popper himself had to say about all this. But this chapter, chapter four of the fabric of reality, is even more famous among some fans of the book for another reason. It has perhaps the best refutation of solipsism known, and hence the best defense of realism. It is often claimed in philosophical circles that we cannot prove we are not in a simulation, or dreaming everything that we experience moment to moment, or another way to put this is that there is no experimental test, no observation we can make, and hence no scientific explanation that allows us to falsify the claim that we exist in a simulation. So apparently, both mathematics or logic, as well as science, are impotent in the face of claims that this is all a simulation, or a dream, or a deception from an evil demon. This chapter does away with all of those concerns by revealing that mathematics and science are not the only games in town when it comes to comprehensively refuting bad explanations like those. We will come in this chapter very quickly to the supposed hierarchy of academic disciplines, with the certainty of mathematics supposed supposedly at the pinnacle, scientific claims just a little less than certain, and the supposed mere matter of taste arguments that exist in philosophy. But let's not steal all of that thunder right now. I've hinted enough at what's to come in this chapter, and so let's get straight into it. Chapter 4, Criteria for Reality, which begins with David writing, and I quote, the great physicist Galileo Galilei, who was arguably also the first physicist in the modern sense, made many discoveries not only in physics itself, but also in the methodology of science. He revived the ancient idea of expressing general theories about nature in mathematical form and improved upon it by developing the method of systematic experimental testing, which characterizes science as we know it. He aptly called such tests cementi, or ordeals. He was one of the first to use telescopes to study celestial objects, and he collected and analyzed evidence for the heliocentric theory. The theory that the Earth moves in orbit around the Sun and spins about its own axis. End quote. And just my brief reflection on that, prior to Galileo, there was indeed a dominant school of philosophy or science or knowledge, whatever you want to call it, the intelligentsia, that assumed knowledge came to us by pure reason alone, more than anything else. Pure reason, namely mathematics, logic, the use of the mind without needing to consult external reality was perfect, they thought, in a way that the physical world wasn't. So it was really Galileo who began the practice, okay, the formal practice of focusing on experiment as distinguishing between theories. It did, of course, take Popper to begin constructing the theoretical apparatus, which allowed us to focus on the philosophy of how exactly all of that worked. And of course, today we're brought to when David Deutsch explains how all of that is necessary. Experimental uh, work is, of course, necessary in science, but it's not sufficient. Uh, and this, in fact, interestingly enough, given the existence of things like or stances like instrumentalism, means that we still have work to do in this area. Back to the book. And David writes, quote, he... Galileo, is best known for his advocacy of that theory and for the bitter conflict with the church into which that advocacy brought him. In 1633, the Inquisition tried him for heresy and forced him under the threat of torture to kneel and read aloud a long abject recantation, saying that he abjured, cursed, and detested the heliocentric theory. Legend has it, probably incorrectly, that as he rose to his feet, he muttered the words, Epur si mueve, meaning and yet it does move. Despite his recantation, he was convicted and sentenced to house arrest, under which he remained for the rest of his life. Although this punishment was comparatively lenient, it achieved its purpose, handsomely. As Jacob Bronowski put it, quote, the result was silence among Catholic scientists everywhere from then on. The effect of the trial and of the imprisonment was to put a total stop to the scientific tradition in the Mediterranean. End quote. That's from The Ascent of Man, page 218 by Jacob Bronowski. And just my reflection on that, 
It seems to me that there in a nutshell, so to speak, is why free speech is such an important or even foundational value. Without it, progress ceases. The threat of punishment, of coercion, of violence can stifle speech. As many have observed, I think this began with John Stuart Mill, self-censorship can be of this kind. Today, there has been a real resurgence of interest in the issue of free speech, but when some people speak about it, they are almost exclusively focused on that American set of concerns, the First Amendment that says that the government will not censor or pass laws to prevent the freedom of speech. In other countries, there are similar concerns. What laws might the government pass and put in place that prevent people freely expressing themselves? But this issue of government censorship, perhaps the only form of true censorship in the legal sense, is, as many philosophers have observed, really only half the story, important as that part of the story is. John Stuart Mill got there in his work On Liberty. So I'll quote a passage from chapter two of On Liberty and explain it here. Mill wrote, quote, In respect to all persons, but those whose pecuniary circumstances make them independent of the good will of other people, opinion on this subject is as efficacious as law. Men might as well be imprisoned as excluded from the means of earning their bread, end quote. So what he's saying there is that if your pecuniary interests, your job in other words, depends on your saying or not saying certain things, then this is as efficacious as law. If you would lose your job for saying something, then it's not really like having freedom, is it? He goes on, quote from Mill, Those whose bread is already secured and who desire no favours from men in power or from bodies of men or from the public have nothing to fear from the open avowal of any opinions but to be ill thought of and ill spoken of, and this it ought not to require a very heroic mould to enable them to bear, end quote. And so what he's saying there is that if you've got your bread secured, in other words, you've got enough money and you don't want anything from other people in power, then you're free to say what you like, except that you might be ill spoken of. How many people want to put up with social ostracism, we might wonder? The state might very well have no laws against speech, but your community might very well effectively cut you off. Our last quote from Mill, quote, There is no room for any appeal, ad misericordium, in behalf of such persons. By the way, just an aside from me, ad misericordium, that means don't appeal to pity, don't feel sorry for people who won't speak up for fear of being ostracised. And Mill goes on, but though we do not now inflict so much evil on those who think differently from us, as it was formerly our custom to do, it may be that we do ourselves as much evil as ever by our treatment of them, end quote. So, there's the key point. This social thing, Mill thinks, is as important as the legal thing. Now, this is very important today. Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, etc. should have the legal right to set their rules and censor, although there is a dispute in the community about this. You know, some people think that the government really should intervene. Now, I think that that is wrong, that Facebook, Twitter, etc., whatever social media company it happens to be, should be perfectly free to, on their platforms, set the rules. But we also have to consider the effects of banning people, as they seem to do rather routinely, swiftly and readily, with little recourse. And they have the legal right. But on Mill's view, and those of others, Roger Scruton is a more recent example of arguing for this, what tends to happen is that if those platforms do become known, as they seem to be, for their internal censorship practices, which might be seen as arbitrary and harsh, the effect is for people to self-censor because they do not wish to be ostracised from the community, the online community. Even if they do not get banned, many may not say what they would prefer to say for fear of being de-boosted, as it's called, or simply poorly treated by their social media circle. So when we've never had more opportunity to share ideas and learn knowledge and network, we might likewise simultaneously have a modern-day silencing of a kind by proxy. So Mill foresaw this and Mill was concerned about this when he was writing centuries ago.
So if what you're concerned about is progress, then yes, any legal imposition on people being free to speak is anathema to solving problems and understanding reality. It is preventing the collision of ideas with each other, as well as with reality. This was the issue Galileo had, a legal constraint on what he could say, and then a chilling effect on the rest of the scientific community. But let's be clear that this is not the only chilling effect that can occur when it comes to speech. There are real social pressures as well. And today, because we have this thing called social media, it may well be amplified. My guess is that any stifling of speech might well be mitigated today by the fact that so much more of it is out there and being amplified. But this will have a selection effect associated with it especially courageous people, or people of a certain kind, let's say, of a prickly nature, or people in a position of, as Mill hints at, personal means, will find it easier to speak out. Those who work for wages or a salary might be legally free to say whatever they like, but if your immediate concern is putting bread on the table, then risking that by speaking the truth might not be a gamble you will take. Okay, back to the book. And David writes, How could a dispute about the layout of the solar system have such far-reaching consequences and why did the participants pursue it so passionately? Because the real dispute was not about whether the solar system had one layout rather than another. It was about Galileo's brilliant advocacy of a new and dangerous way of thinking about reality. Not about the existence of reality, for both Galileo and the church believed in realism, the common sense view that an external physical universe really does exist and does affect our senses, including senses enhanced by instruments such as telescopes. Where Galileo differed was in his conception of the relationship between physical reality on the one hand and human ideas, observations and reason on the other. He believed that the universe could be understood in terms of universal, mathematically formulated laws, and that a reliable knowledge of these laws was accessible to human beings if they applied his method of mathematical formulation and systematic experimental testing. As he put it, the book of nature is written in mathematical symbols. This was in conscious comparison with that other book on which it was more conventional to rely. End quote. Now let's just consider there David's claim that both Galileo and the church believed in realism. This is a commonly misunderstood point. Religious people can, and often are in fact, realists. Even people who have otherwise unscientific beliefs can be realists. It's rather like how religious people often have a realistic or objective view of morality. They think there exists a difference in reality between good and evil. And both of those things really exist. But being a realist, of course, does not make you invaluable. You can still make errors. In fact, you would expect to make errors because you understand there is an objective reality out there about which you can be wrong. So the thing about religious people on this account, uh, Christians of this kind that, for example, Galileo is debating against, they don't fall for the it's all a dream argument and logically equivalent claims. But of course, That doesn't mean that what they think is real actually is real. Let's go back to the book. And David writes, Galileo understood that if his method was indeed reliable, then wherever it was applicable, its conclusions had to be preferable to those obtained by any other method. Therefore, he insisted that scientific reasoning took precedence not only over intuition and common sense, but also over religious doctrine and revelation. It was specifically that idea, and not the heliocentric theory as such, that the authorities considered dangerous. And they were right. For if any idea can be said to have initiated the scientific revolution and the Enlightenment, and to have provided the secular foundation of modern civilization, it is that one. It was forbidden to hold or defend the heliocentric theory as an explanation of the appearance of the night sky. But using the heliocentric theory, writing about it, holding it as a mathematical supposition, or defending it as a method of making predictions, they were all permitted. That was why Galileo's dialogue of the two chief world systems, which compared the heliocentric theory with the official geocentric theory, had been cleared for printing by church censors. The Pope had even acquiesced in advance to Galileo's writing such a book, though at the trial a misleading document was produced claiming 
that Galileo had been forbidden to discuss the issue at all. It is an interesting historical footnote that in Galileo's time it was not yet indisputable that the heliocentric theory gave better predictions than the geocentric theory. The available observations were not very accurate. Ad hoc modifications had been proposed to improve the accuracy of the geocentric theory, and it was hard to quantify the predictive powers of the two rival theories. These are, just end quote there, just my reflection on this, these ad hoc modifications to the geocentric theory were basically, well, if you consider what the geocentric theory was all about, you have the Earth at the centre and then all the other celestial bodies are going around the Earth. Now, if you just assume that they're moving in circles around the Earth, then the predictions that the geocentric theory makes over time tend to move out of sync with what's going what's going on in reality. So what you do is instead of having the celestial objects like the sun and the moon and the other planets moving in circles around the earth, you have them moving in slightly more complicated motions where you have well what is called a circle on a circle or an epicycle. So you have the planets for example doing little circles as they as they're going around the sun they're moving in circles on the circular orbits and then if you need to have further epicycles circle circular orbits on circular orbits on circular orbits you can do that as well but it's ad hoc because you can just keep adding on these epicycles there's no reason for postulating the reality of these things other than to try and match what's really going on in reality let's go back to the book that david writes furthermore when it comes to the details there is more than one heliocentric theory Galileo believed that the planets move in circles, while in fact their orbits are very nearly ellipses. So the data did not fit the particular heliocentric theory that Galileo was defending either, so much then for his having been convinced by accumulated observations. But for all that, the church took no position on this controversy. The Inquisition did not care where the planets appeared to be. What they cared about was reality. They cared where the planets really were, and they wanted to understand the planets through explanations, just as Galileo did. Instrumentalists and positivists would say that since the church was perfectly willing to accept Galileo's observational predictions, further argument between them was pointless and his muttering epur si mueve was strictly meaningless. But Galileo knew better and so did the Inquisition. When they denied the reliability of scientific knowledge, it was precisely the explanatory part of that knowledge that they had in mind. Their worldview was false, but it was not illogical. Admittedly, they believed in revelation and traditional authority as sources of reliable knowledge, but they also had an independent reason for criticizing the reliability of knowledge obtained by Galileo's methods. They could simply point out that no amount of observation or argument can ever prove that one explanation of a physical phenomena is true and another false. As they would put it, God could produce the same observed effects in an infinity of different ways so it is pure vanity and arrogance to claim to possess a way of knowing merely through one's own fallible observation and reason, which way he, God, chose. To some extent, they were merely arguing for modesty, for a recognition of human fallibility. And if Galileo was claiming that the heliocentric theory was somehow proven, or nearly so, in some inductive sense, they had a point. If Galileo thought that his methods could confer on any theory an authority comparable to which the church claimed for its doctrines, they were right to criticize him as arrogant, or as they would have put it, blasphemous. Though, of course, by the same standard, they were much more arrogant themselves. So how can we defend Galileo against the Inquisition? What should Galileo's defense have been in the face of this charge of claiming too much, when he claimed that scientific theories contain reliable knowledge of reality? The Popperian defense of science as a process of problem-solving and explanation-seeking is not sufficient in itself. For the Church, too, was primarily interested in explanations and not predictions, and it was quite willing to let Galileo solve problems using any theory he chose. It was just that they did not accept Galileo's solutions, which they would call mere mathematical hypotheses, had any bearing on physical reality. Problem solving, after all, is a process that takes place entirely within human minds. So Galileo may have seen the world as a book in which the laws of nature are written in mathematical symbols, but that is strictly a metaphor. There are no explanations in orbit out there with the planets. The fact is that all our problems and solutions are located within ourselves, having been created by ourselves. When we solve problems in science, we arrive through argument at theories whose explanations seem best to us. Pausing there, 
going back, let's just read that again because it's important to keep that front of mind when we're considering the worldview of David Deutsch coming from Popper. I'll say it again, quote from David, the fact is that all our problems and solutions are located within ourselves. Isn't that wonderful? So that saying that there's no way of deriving anything from outside. The only purpose for referring to external reality is to decide between those things within yourself, the problem within yourself and the solution you conjecture within yourself. The purpose of observation is to check which of the solutions really do solve the problem that you have. Or another way of putting that is which of the explanations that you conjecture actually turn out to be go unrefuted, and the other ones go refuted by the observation that you make. So let's go on. David writes, again, when we solve problems in science, we arrive through argument at theories whose explanation seem best to us. So without in any way denying that it is right and proper and useful for us to solve problems, the Inquisition and modern skeptics might legitimately ask what scientific problem solving has to do with reality We may find our best explanations psychologically satisfying. We may find them helpful in making predictions. We certainly find them essential in every area of technological creativity. All this does justify our continuing to seek them and to use them in those ways. But why should we be obliged to take them as fact? The proposition that the Inquisition forced Galileo to endorse was in effect this, that the Earth is in fact at rest, with the sun and planets in motion around it but that the paths on which these astronomical bodies travel are laid out in a complex way when viewed from the vantage point of Earth is also consistent with the sun being at rest and the Earth and the planets being in motion. Let me call that the Inquisition's theory of the solar system. If the Inquisition's theory were true, we should still expect the heliocentric theory to make accurate predictions of the results of all Earth-based astronomical observations, even though it would be factually false. It would therefore seem that any observations that appear to support the heliocentric theory lend equal support to the Inquisition's theory. Okay, pausing there, my reflection. So the thing here is, and this is a theme that runs through the philosophy of David Deutsch throughout both of his books, is that using observations to support your theory is a dead end. Because Inconsistent theories can be regarded as containing the same amount of support given a certain amount of observations. Here we see an example of this. Almost any observation we make of the sky is going to support this geocentric theory. After all, you can walk outside right now and plot the position of the celestial objects in the sky, including the sun, over the course of a 24-hour period, and those observations are going to be, using your naked eye, consistent with geocentrism. They're going to support geocentrism because if if what you think the project of science is about is supporting a particular theory with ever more accumulated evidence, you're going to succeed in being able to support that theory, false though it is. And indeed, you can use such a theory, this geocentric theory, in order to predict the position of these celestial bodies on the sky day after day after day. You can make extremely accurate predictions of where the sun's going to be tomorrow in the sky if you assume that the Earth is at the centre. If all you're interested in is supporting particular theories and making predictions, you can rely upon known-to-be false explanations. In fact, you don't really have to be concerned about explanations at all to begin with, because if what you're really after are predictions, and this is David Deutsch's deep point about the project of science, that we need to be focused on explanations if we are realists. We can concede that not everyone's a realist, but that doesn't prevent us from remaining committed to the project of science as being about good explanations, because we want to come to a deeper and deeper understanding of the reality that we inhabit. We are not primarily concerned in any area or outside of science in predicting what's going to happen next. In the special case of science, yes, we are. But it's only a small part of the scientific project. After all, if we consider the entire science of biology, sometimes what we're interested in is how exactly species arise over time. Evolution by natural selection is an explanation of the biological diversity that we see. However, simultaneously, it doesn't allow you necessarily to make accurate predictions about what species will arise next. In fact, it tells you why that project of trying to explain 
the direction of evolution is a fool's errand because, as we like to say, evolution by natural selection is a blind process. It cannot see ahead as to how life will change over time, given a change in conditions in the ecosystems and niches that life might evolve into might adapt itself towards. So I'm skipping a a part. Um, David talks about how the fact, well, there's no way in which we could rule out using experiment a theory like, for example, that the Earth is just at the centre of a ginormous planetarium and that planetarium was giving us apparent feedback that was consistent with a heliocentric theory. This is the simulation argument in disguise, this idea that there might be this hugely complicated entity that is giving us the appearance of realism and external reality, but which actually forms the border between what we experience as reality and outside of that thing being something that we have no access to. So I'm skipping that and I'll just pick it up where David writes, quote, To us, the Inquisition's theory looks hopelessly contrived. Why should we accept such a complicated and ad hoc account of why the sky looks as it does when the unadorned, heliocentric cosmology does the same job with less fuss. We may cite the principle of Occam's razor. Do not multiply entities beyond necessity. Or as I prefer to put it, do not complicate explanations beyond necessity. Because if you do, the unnecessarily complications themselves remain unexplained. However, whether an explanation is or is not contrived or unnecessarily complicated depends on all the other ideas and explanations that make up one's worldview. The Inquisition would have argued that the idea of the earth moving is an unnecessary complication. It contradicts common sense. It contradicts scripture. And they would have said there is a perfectly good explanation that does without it. But is there? Does the Inquisition's theory really provide alternative explanations without having to introduce the counterintuitive complication of the heliocentric system? Just pausing there, my reflection. So today, using the best explanation of epistemology and the philosophy of science given to us in the beginning of infinity, we would say that heliocentrism is the hard to vary explanation, while geocentrism, in order to continue to make more and more accurate predictions, had to be easy to vary. It had to allow the adding on of more epicycles whenever the predictions were out by a certain amount. Adding epicycles is an easy variation. However, it's very difficult to vary heliocentrism in the same way. Let's go back to the book. And David writes, quote, Let us take a closer look at how the Inquisition's theory explains things. It explains the apparent stationarity of the Earth by saying that it is is stationary. So far, so good. On the face of it, that explanation is better than Galileo's, for he had to work very hard and contradict some common sense notions of force and inertia to explain why we do not feel the Earth move. But how does the Inquisition's theory cope with the more difficult task of explaining planetary motions? The heliocentric theory explains them by saying that the planets are seen to move in complicated loops across the sky because they are really moving in simple circles or ellipses in space, but the Earth is moving as well. The Inquisition's explanation is that the planets are seen to move in complicated loops because they are really moving in complicated loops in space, but, and here according to the Inquisition's theory comes the essence of the explanation, this complicated motion is governed by a simple underlying principle, namely that the planets move in such a way that when viewed from Earth they appear just as they would if they and the Earth were in simple orbits around the Sun. To understand the planetary motions in terms of the Inquisition's theory, it is essential that one should understand this principle, for the constraints it imposes are the basis of every detailed explanation that one can make under the theory. For example, if one were asked why a planetary conjunction occurred on such and such a date, or why a planet backtracked across the sky in a loop of a particular shape, the answer would always be because that is how it would look if if the heliocentric theory were true. So here is a cosmology, the Inquisition's cosmology, that can be understood only in terms of a different cosmology, the heliocentric theory, that it contradicts, but faithfully mimics. Pausing there, my reflection. So as we might say of this theory, using this argument, namely the Inquisition's theory, the geocentric theory, taken seriously, this version of the geocentric theory simply is heliocentrism with some additional assumptions, namely that everything appears to be consistent entirely and explained well by heliocentrism, except 
we're going to add the assumption that heliocentrism is not actually true and geocentrism is true. But otherwise, everything else works out the same. All the predictions that one makes is perfectly consistent with heliocentrism being true. But we're just going to tack on this negation of the entire theory that although it does appear to be true and appear to be the best explanation, we're going to nonetheless regard it as axiomatically false because geocentrism we just take as dogmatically the truth about our cosmology. And I'm skipping a part and I'll just pick it up where David says on this exact point, quote, Therefore, we are right to regard the Inquisition's theory as a convoluted elaboration of the heliocentric theory rather than vice versa. We have arrived at this conclusion not by judging the Inquisition's theory against modern cosmology, which would have been a circular argument, but by insisting on taking the Inquisition's theory seriously in its own terms as an explanation of the world. I have mentioned the grass cure theory, which can be ruled out without experimental testing because it contained no explanation. Here, we have a theory which can also be ruled out without experimental experimental testing because it contains a bad explanation and an explanation which in its own terms is worse than its rival. Pausing there, just my reflection. Yes. So what we're saying here is we have two theories. Both of them make exactly the same predictions. One of them is simpler than the other, namely heliocentrism is simpler than the geocentric theory as presented here because the geocentric theory assumes that all the positions of the planets that we observe are perfectly consistent with heliocentrism, except it's not true. So it is, as we say, heliocentric them plus this additional assumption of it not being true. And David goes on to say, quote, As I have said, the Inquisition were realists, yet their theory has this in common with solipsism. Both of them draw an arbitrary boundary beyond which they claim human reason has no access, or at least beyond which problem solving is no path to understanding. For solipsists, the boundary tightly encloses their own brains, or perhaps just their abstract minds or incorporeal souls. For the Inquisition, it enclosed the entire Earth. Some present-day creationists believe in a similar boundary Boundary, not in space, but in time, for they believe that the universe was created only 6,000 years ago, complete with misleading evidence of earlier events. Pausing there, just my reflection on this. We might well add to this any of the modern incantations of solipsism, one of which is, well, this is all a simulation of some kind or other, including the so-called simulation argument from Bostrom. It stands on the same logical footing as these ideas about solipsism. It postulates a reality beyond which we have have no access experimentally, scientifically, and perhaps even using our reason. What we say is that the only thing we have access to are the contents of the simulation, or the dream, or the deceptions that are going on caused by the evil demon, whatever it happens to be. If it is a simulation, if we are living in a computer simulation, then it postulates a world outside the one we are experiencing in which the computer on which this reality we experience is running. But we don't have access to that computer or the universe in which that computer actually exists. It's postulating a metaphysical reality on the same footing as whatever is doing the dreaming, in which whatever the entity is, presumably it's you, if you're dreaming all of this, in which that entity exists. As David says on this point, after I skip another uh, paragraph, he writes, quote, there is a large class of related theories here, but we can usefully regard them all as variants of solipsism. They differ in where they draw the boundary of reality or the boundary of that part of reality which is comprehensible through problem solving, and they differ in whether and how they seek knowledge outside that boundary. But they all consider scientific rationality and other problem solving to be inapplicable outside the boundary. A mere game. They might concede that it can be a satisfying and useful game, but it is nevertheless only a game from which no valid conclusion can be drawn about the reality outside. End quote. Yes, so as I say, uh, these other versions of solipsism, you know, the one that the one that says that you're dreaming all of this into existence, or that you and a friend are dreaming all of this into existence, or that all conscious creatures on planet Earth are dreaming reality into existence. Plato's cave was one of the earliest versions of this, that because we don't have direct access to reality, we might be utterly deceived about the true nature of reality in some way or other. Descartes came along and talked about how a demon could be deceiving us, and so this led him down a route of his so-called method of doubt. The movie, the, the movie series, the Matrix, and the, the simulation arguments, it's all the same. All these things are versions of solipsism. Perhaps no philosopher is more closely associated with solipsism than Descartes, because Descartes had this idea that there was one thing that could not be doubted, and that is the individual's 
own mind, the existence of their own mind. And, and he said it was basically a logical necessity. If you read the meditations, he doesn't really regard it as an argument. He says it's a necessary truth. I think I am is true whenever I think it. Now, I used to buy this. I used to think, yes, this is the only thing that we cannot doubt. If you're thinking, then therefore you exist. But as David says... In the fabric of reality, in the very next paragraph I'm about to read, this entails taking on board a whole bunch more things that one regards as being absolutely true. Let's just read what David says here. Quote, Despite Descartes' desire to base his philosophy on this supposedly firm foundation, he actually allowed himself many other assumptions and was certainly no solipsist. End quote. So what did what does David mean by these many other assumptions. What I think is meant here is if you're going to argue in the same way that Descartes did, that I think I am is a necessary truth, or as it's usually rendered, and I think he said this elsewhere, cogito ergo sum, which is I think therefore I exist. So that sort of suggests that it's kind of an argument, whereas I think David, whereas I think Descartes in the meditations was actually saying it's just a necessary truth. It's just if you if you are able to think those words, I think or I exist, or something, you can think anything at all, then you exist, you necessarily you exist. But whatever the case, you're formulating those thoughts in language. So therefore, you think the language renders reality perfectly well. So not only do you think that this captures a necessary truth, a firm foundation on which to base everything else, you're also thinking the language is inerrant as well. It's able to capture your thoughts inerrantly, which means that you you cannot possibly be mistaken about the meanings of words or what the letters that make up the words happen to be. There's a whole bunch that you're admitting are also equally true as the claim, I think, therefore I exist. If I think, therefore I exist, is your foundational truth, then that amounts to an argument. So you're thinking that logic is perfectly inerrant. You're thinking that language is perfectly inerrant. You're thinking that what you think now is equivalent to what you think in the future. That these words, like exist, for example, label a concept which also you cannot be mistaken about. So there's rather much that you're claiming to not possibly be mistaken about when you say there's only one thing that I think I cannot be mistaken about, namely that I exist. Well, if you truly think that, then you're also trying to say that you can't possibly be mistaken about the word I, the word exists, what I exist, the conjunction of those two things means, what the letters in those words mean, what the noises coming out of your mouth mean, or what the supposed thought in your head really means. So you're arguing for a vast ensemble of things that you think you are infallible about. But if we're fallibilists, we can reject all of that and we can say, well, we could still be mistaken about any one of those things because that's the nature of creating knowledge that we have. It's error prone and we could be wrong about it. It's not to say that you don't exist, by the way. It's just to say that you can't be absolutely 100% certain that you exist. That's all. That's all we're saying, that there's a possibility. Now, even if you can't think of a way in which you might be mistaken. That's no refutation of the fact that you could be mistaken. As I like to say, your inability to imagine how you might be mistaken is not a refutation of the fact that you could be mistaken. It just means you have a poor imagination or an insufficiently good imagination to imagine all the ways in which you might be mistaken. You are fallible after all. Okay, so let's go to the part of the chapter where David is refuting solipsism, not by experiment, not by logical proof, but by argument. If we take solipsism seriously, what it's saying is basically you're dreaming things into existence. So you're the only person that exists and everything you experience, all of reality, is nothing but a product of your dreaming. You were born dreaming, you're dreaming now, and you will die dreaming. So the external reality, none of it really truly exists. It's just part of your dream. What's wrong with this? Well, let's read what David says about this. Quote, if there are sources of ideas that behave as if they were independent of oneself, then they necessarily are independent of oneself. For if I define myself as the conscious entity that has the thoughts and feelings I am aware of having, then the dream people I seem to interact with are by definition something other than that narrowly defined self. And so I must concede that something other than myself exists. Pausing there, my reflection. And so this is the beginning of the refutation of solipsism. Namely that if you're dreaming into existence a reality which is independently so complex 
as to be unpredictable by yourself, by your dreaming self, then those other entities are indeed real. Real in the sense that they appear in whatever way you're going to explain this dreamlike reality. Everything you're interacting with is a source of an idea or a, a, a prompt, an observation. Another person might be a source of an idea as well. So some of the ideas are not coming from inside you, but you're getting them from other people people that you're interacting with. And if they're just a product of your mind, if these other people are a product of your mind, then that's a rather unusual way of defining oneself. Not only as the source of particular ideas about those people, but those people as being sources of ideas that are not you. So your conscious self is not really all that you are. What you are is your conscious self and then all these other entities that you're interacting with, the dream people that you interact with on a daily basis. As David goes on to say, quote, my only other option, if I were a committed solipsist, would be to regard the dream people as creations of my unconscious mind, and therefore as part of myself in a looser sense. But then I should be forced to concede that myself had a very rich structure, most of which is independent of my conscious self. Within that structure are entities, dream people, who despite being mere constituents of the mind of a supposed solipsist, behave exactly as if they were committed anti-solipsists. So I could not call myself wholly a solipsist, for only my narrowly defined self would take that view. Many, apparently most, of the opinions held within my mind as a whole would oppose solipsism. Pause there, my reflection. So what's he saying here? He's saying here that if you're really truly going to try and believe that you're a solipsist, in other words, you're the only thing that exists in reality and everything is being dreamed into existence, most of that reality that's being dreamed into existence consists of... Well, the people in that reality hold the view that solipsism is not true. And so you, if you're dreaming all of this into existence, primarily consists of ideas, minds that object to your apparent belief in solipsism. They're the ones, they're the people you're going to interact with who are going to say, you're foolish for believing that you're a solipsist. After all, here am I, supposedly, part of you, part of your dream that is telling you solipsism is false. <laughs> Out of square that circle, that most of you, most of your mind actually rejects solipsism because after all, your mind also consists of the dream people. Isn't that bizarre? David goes on to say, quote, I could study the outer region of myself and find that it seems to obey certain laws. The same laws as the dream textbooks say apply to what they call the physical universe. I would find that there is far more of the outer region than the inner region. Aside from containing more ideas, it is also more complex, more varied, and has more measurable variables by a literally astronomical factor than the inner region. Moreover, this outer region is amenable to scientific study using the methods of Galileo. Because I have now been forced to define that region as part of myself, solipsism no longer has any argument against the validity of such study, which is now defined as no more than a form of introspection. Pausing there, my reflection. That's basically it. Okay, that's the refutation. Solipsism basically begins by saying it's all a dream, but taken seriously, the contents of the dream act unpredictably, in many cases autonomously, and the physical world can even be studied. So basically nothing has changed except the addition of a useless assumption, namely the assumption that it's all a dream. Jeron Lanier makes this point in a particular discussion I'm linking to here, I'll put that up on the screen, and in the notes of the podcast, that yeah, this is a closer to truth interview he has. And he talks about the simulation argument, you know, basically a form of solipsism, where he says, well, look, if science still works under this metaphysical assumption of it all being simulated or dreamed, then what does it's a simulation actually add to our understanding of reality? Again, this whole simulation dream thing is refuted, not by a mathematical or logical disproof of the hypothesis, nor by any experimental evidence, but rather something in a sense way more compelling a philosophical argument that the simulation or solipsism claim is a bad explanation. We should notice in beginning of infinity terms, it's easy to vary. After all, this solipsism claim, this claim that one person is dreaming, could easily be varied to and, and maintain all the same predictions by saying that two such people are dreaming. Three, pick your number of people are dreaming this reality into existence or the number of computers on which it's being simulated, or the number of demons deceiving people into thinking this is true, and so on and so forth. All of these different ways of denying basic realism 
are easy to vary and therefore bad explanations and can be rejected on that basis. David goes on to say, quote, Thus we see that if we take solipsism seriously, if we assume that it is true and that all valid explanations must scrupulously conform to it, it self-destructs. How exactly does solipsism, taken seriously, differ from its common sense rival, realism? The difference is based on no more than a renaming scheme. Solipsism insists on referring to objectively different things, such as external reality and, and my unconscious mind or introspection and scientific observation by the same names. But then it has to reintroduce the distinction through explanations in terms of something like the outer part of myself. But no such extra explanations would be necessary without its insistence on an inexplicable renaming scheme. Solipsism must also postulate the existence of an additional class of processes, invisible, inexplicable processes, which give the mind the illusion of living in an external reality. The solipsist who believes that nothing exists other than the contents of one mind must also believe that the mind is a phenomenon of greater multiplicity than is normally supposed. It contains other people-like thoughts, planet-like thoughts, and laws of physics-like thoughts. These thoughts are real. They develop in a complex way, or pretend to, and they have enough autonomy to surprise, disappoint, enliven, or thwart that other class of thoughts which call themselves I. Thus, the solipsist's explanation of the world is in terms of interacting thoughts rather than interacting objects. But those thoughts are real and interact according to the same rules that the realist says govern the interaction of objects. Thus, solipsism, far from being a worldview stripped to its essentials, is actually just realism disguised and weighed down by additional unnecessary assumptions. Worthless baggage introduced only to be explained away. Pausing there, my reflection. I just love that line. It's probably one of my favorite lines in all the fabric of reality. This idea of the additional unnecessary assumptions being worthless baggage introduced only to be explained away. I've probably repurposed or rephrased it a number of times over the years in response to various different kinds of anti-realist metaphysical claims and bad philosophy and bad explanations. So that refutation of solipsism and all similar arguments is basically where I'm going to finish it today. Okay, I'll read one more paragraph because I think that this, this is one of the most powerful and in my experience, most talked about parts of the fabric of reality. That here we have a refutation and an argument that shows the poverty of these anti-realistic arguments. And, you know, you go along to a philosophy lecture at university and eventually you come across, usually it comes via Descartes, this idea that it might all be a dream, that what is really real and you get into these deep philosophical arguments and you are told there's no way that science can disprove this or no way that, usually it's put in those kind of terms, you know, there's no scientific evidence that you can bring forth to show that it's not all a dream. But who cares? Who cares about the fact there's no scientific evidence to show that this is false? That's to privilege a particular way of refuting bad ideas. There's a better way. In this, in this circumstance, certainly, the better way is to reveal the poverty of the explanation that is solipsism or the simulation argument. To say, look, it's basically just realism plus additional unnecessary assumptions that don't help us to understand reality any better. And if you assume that it's all going on in your mind, then you're assuming that your mind is just equally as complex as what realism says the physical world happens to be. It's just that you're saying it's not really a physical world. It's all in my head. But then this raises all sorts of questions about what's really going on in your head. If we take it seriously, then reality is just reality. It's just that it's in your head. But how and why and so on and so forth become questions that would need to be asked if we were to take this seriously. So we refute it not by experiment, not by logical disproof, but simply by philosophical argument. As David goes on to say in the last paragraph that I'll read, quote, by this argument, we can dispense with solipsism and all the related theories. They are all indefensible. Incidentally, we have rejected one worldview on these grounds, namely positivism, the theory that all statements other than those describing or predicting observations are meaningless. As I remarked in chapter one, positivism asserts its own meaninglessness and therefore cannot be consistently defended. So we can continue reassured with common sense realism and the pursuit 
of explanations by scientific methods, end quote. And in the next episode, I'll introduce Popper into the mix. I'll bring Popper into the mix as well because Popper wrote about realism, common sense realism in objective knowledge, and it comes to bear directly on this. But for now, until next time, bye-bye.